This is, um, well, mainly warm blood, so we're moving out of racehorses, I'm afraid. Um, and it's, um, it's more a collection of, uh, of uh, findings and cases that I've been uh, collecting for this particular talk. It's not a specific study, uh, but I went through all the cases I've seen uh, for a long time and see what actually I can see in radiographs which predict potentially which soft tissue lesion we might see. Um, so if, if we wanted to, to know which soft tissue lesion there might be in the foot, obviously we need to know what we're looking for. Um, so first I will talk a little bit about which soft tissue lesion we may see, and then I will go through each radiographic findings which may be relevant, and then I will compare this with what we see on cross-section and especially MRI. Um, first of all, when we look at radiographs, which changes um, may help us identify soft tissue lesion. Well, first of all, swelling. Uh, of course, we might have seen the horse or we may have already seen the swelling, but sometimes either we have not seen the horse or perhaps the swelling was not as obvious as it would be on radiographs. Um, and then if we look specifically at soft tissue lesion, then we will probably find remodeling at the ligament or tendon uh, attachment to the bone. Uh, so obviously we need to know the anatomy of the structure we're looking at to know then which uh, soft tissue lesion will be involved. Um, what we need to remember um, is that bone reacts uh, only in two ways. So we can either have production of bone or uh, uh, bone lysis. And some of the changes uh, may stay or persist for a long time. I mean, we've seen in yearlings, uh, many go away, but in, in, in old horses, they might stay. So you see an antesified, and, and that will be uh, present for, for a long time and might not be clinically relevant. Also, when you see changes in opacity, uh, has to be a quite uh, a substantial uh, amount of uh, mineral content change to be actually seen radiologically. So some of the changes we will, uh, we will not um, identify. Um, if we look at m multiple studies that have done on MRI, the soft tissue lesion that we, uh, we can see are multiple, but what we mainly learn is that the navicular bone pathology, which was the main culprit of lameness before MRI came along, is actually not very common on its own. And most of the time we have changes of the ligaments attaching to the navicular bone and the deep tissue flexor tendon. Um, and if we look at these um, very uh, large uh, studies, we see that actually only 8-9% of the horses had navicular disease as the primary cause of lameness, and majority of the horse will have uh, other injury, which say so injuries of, for example, collateral ligaments of bones, and uh, horses, many horses will have a combination of injuries of the polycircular apparatus or um, uh, navicular uh, ligaments of the navicular bone. Uh, and this is a, a different study, but mainly showing the same thing. So majority of the horses will have uh, multiple injuries within the foot, causing uh, primary cause of lameness. And then you will have horses with uh, deep tissue flexor tendon lesion and collateral ligament dysmorphophy. But you can see that many horses have this pathology in combination with uh, other lesions within the foot. Um, and if we if we look at the, uh, not at the cause of pain, but the actual number of injuries, uh, then we can see that the deep shell effects attendant is the uh, most common pathology we can uh, find in the foot. Um, and there are association between changes in the navicular bone and changes in the, uh, in the deep tissue flexor tendon or, or changes in the navicular bone and ligament dysmorphism. So we can look at all these things to, on radiology to predict which sort of pathology we might find on MRI. Um, I'll just now present radiographic findings in the order that makes sense to me. It's basically the order I look radiographs uh, on. So um, I'll start, first of all, with foot conformation, because that's the first thing I, I look at when I look at the foot. Uh, hopefully you have a nice straight lateral media view. Uh, and, um, and we know that we need to look at uh, the position of the distal failings within the who from radiographs because when we look at the foot from the outside we, can, we can't actually tell how it's positioned. And the reason why this may be important uh, for uh, soft tissue lesion is because um, it has been thought that changes in the angle of insertion of the deep tissue flexor tendon on the distal phalanx may change changes the tension in the deep tissue flexor tendon itself and then perhaps could be associated uh, with injuries. 
So a horse with this sort of conformation will have more tension on the deep chill flexor tendon than a horse with this conformation. And there are two studies that looked, among other things, at this. Um, this is a, a study that came out from Italy and they did um, a, a lot of measurements on radiographs and then they uh, tried to correlate those radiographic measurements to, so, so, to lesion within uh, the foot detected on MRI. Um, and they basically tried to create a model and then if you put all these um, uh, measurements into the computer then it will tell you which lesion uh, it, it is. But actually I don't think it has worked quite as well as they thought. But anyway, if we just think about uh, Look at the solar angle. So they measured uh, the angle between the solar border of distal phalanx and the sole, um, and they uh, actually did not find any association between this angle and the presence of deep shield effects tendon lesion. Um, what they did find is that if there was a change in thickness of the palmar quartz navicular bone, then there will be uh, more the horse would be more likely to have a deep shield effects tendon lesion. Um, and this is a different study. This comes out from the Royal Veterinary College, and they uh, did also a lot of measurements, uh, but they did those on MRI. Uh, so uh, on this case, they measured uh, the angle between the flexor surface of the distal phalanx and the sole. Um, and the reason for that is that when you measure the sorel angle as we did before, um, you actually measure this, the solar border of the distal phalanx, which is not where the deep chill flexor tendon insert. So if you think about the solar, the sole of the distal phalanx could have different degree of concavity, so it actually will make much more sense to measure this angle. So they did this from a mid-sagittal MRI, and, and actually they did find the relationship between a lower angle and the presence of deep chill flexor tendon lesion. They also found a relationship between the heel height index, which was a ratio between the height of the hoof of the coronary band and the uh, height of the hoof of the heels, with the presence of tendon lesion. To suppose that if you have a flatter foot, you're more likely to have a, a tendon lesion, at least for this study. Uh, so this is just to remind you what we measured in two different studies. So this is what we normally measure, or at least what I normally measure, uh, which is the angle between the solar border, the cephalings and the sole. I mean, this green line should actually be at the bottom here. Um, and then this is the angle between the flexor surface and, and the sole, um, which obviously will always be larger than this angle. Um, and perhaps... We should, we should measure this in radiographs, whether I don't think there, is, there are references other than this um, MRI uh, paper, but perhaps that's what we should, we should do. Um, so I will talk a little bit about the navicular bone, uh, and that's because uh, navicular bone, uh, well, is in close contact with the deep chill flexor tendon, obviously, and then we have collateral and median ligament attached on the proximal border. This is a median impal ligament at the distal border. Um, and uh, we should look carefully at uh, both the uh, palmar, proximal, and distal border of the navicular bone if we want to look for soft tissue lesions. Um, we know that uh, this is the same study I've mentioned before, but we know that if we have uh, a high grade. Uh, navicular bones, the so navicular bone with um, uh, more severe changes in radiographs, these are more like these horses are more likely to have pathology either in the navicular bone itself, but also in the tendon or in the uh, uh, ligaments of the navicular bone. So we we can't really underestimate the navicular bone. Um, I will start from the distal border. Um, many of you might have heard this before, so I'll keep it short. Um, so, um, fragments uh, of the distal border, I know that we have long debated about the clinical significance of, of these, uh, but these uh, fragments are embedded in the distal and median impal ligament, and uh, uh, we know that there is an association between the presence of fragments and presence of uh, uh, this is a median impal ligament desmopathy. Of course, by looking at the radiographs on, your own, on their own, you don't know if there are potentially other lesion causing lameness, but that's definitely there. And mainly what we should look at is presence of fragments which have reaction on the 
navicular bone proximal to them, uh, like in this case, or like a cystic lesion, like this case. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, on MRI, you can see how they are embedded in the impa ligament and the reaction uh, proximal to them in the bone. Uh, so if you see this type of fragment, I will definitely report them and perhaps mention that impa ligament dysmopathy may be present. Um, and we know from this study, which actually compared MRI with histopathology, that horses with fragment uh, uh, have changes in the, um, in the impa ligament uh, on histopathology, and also horses with osteocystal lesion have changes in the impa ligament seen on histopathology. And both fragments and osteocystal lesion can be seen on radiographs. Um, so, um, so we should we should report those things. Uh, actually, looking at the impa ligament itself on MRI is pretty difficult, even on high field MRI. Uh, so we rely on the diagnosis of impa ligament dysmitis mostly on the presence of uh, changes at the antheses anyway, uh, and sometimes we can do that on radiology. Um, the proximal border. Um, I always thought the proximal border would far less interesting than the distal border. Uh, that's a personal thought. But anyway, we can see often um, antesified uh, at the proximal border uh, at the insertion of the collapsed somidian ligament. Uh, these are more common laterally than medially. Uh, there are about 20% of lame horses will have it. About 10% of non-lame horses will have it. And I always find very difficult when I report radiographs and say, what's the clinical significance of this? Uh, and I think... I, when it's very small, I probably don't think very much about it. However, sometimes you do find a small antesified, uh, like in this case, and then you find collapsed somidian ligament dysmitis. Um, so perhaps we shouldn't completely ignore it. Um, however, some, uh, uh, if you have proximal border fragments. Oh, well, that's maybe a little bit more interesting. I don't know. This is the only case I've seen, in addition to the one that's in Butler. Um, and I think if the proximal border fragments are similar to the distal border fragment, then perhaps if you have uh, a fragment that might be associated with dysmopathy, but it's such a rare thing that um, we don't really know. And then sometimes radiograph a little bit misleading. Um, I mean, when I saw this, uh, Rage was the first time. Uh, this is a seven years old uh, horse which was lame on the right front. And I did have radiographs of both feet and they looked identical. Uh, well, superficially identical. Um, you can see a very large uh, new bone formation in the proximal aspect of the navicular bone. I personally have never seen one so big before. Um, but it did have quite an odd shape because it looks like it's going palmally rather than dorsally while the collapsed somidian ligament should go. And you can see that it's on the, uh, on the medial side. Um, I had the horse blocked to the AP joint. But um, I thought, looking at this, that perhaps he would have a collateral ligament dysmopathy, collateral somidian ligament dysmopathy. Uh, but actually, when you look at the MRI, I'm just going to slow this video down, otherwise we can't see. When you look at the MRI, you can see that the uh, antesified, well, the new bone is actually here. Can you see it going down and then inserting on the navicular bone? Um, so it's not exactly the location where you would expect the collateral somidian ligament to be. And if you look at the T2 from Spinaco, actually collateral somidian ligament is here, and you can see that it's got normal signal. Uh, perhaps a bit thickened, both of them, um, but uh, not uh, a convincing dysmopathy to me. However, if we go back to the radiographs and we ignore the massive uh, antesified, perhaps we can look at the navicular bone palmar compa bone, and I think you can notice that the palmar compa bone is quite thickened and irregular. Um, and to me, there is um, a poor cortical medulla demarcation here. Um, and in fact, if you, well, if you look at the MRI again, you might have noticed that the horse has also a tendon lesion and reaction into the navicular bone. Um, so that's perhaps uh, also that's perhaps contributed to the lameness more than the actual very large antesified that we saw. Um, 
especially because these horses were lame bilaterally, um, uh, sorry, unilaterally had the, the, the spur bilaterally. Um, if we do see changes to the palmar compa bone, then we have to think about the tendon, the deep steel flexor tendon. Um, and if you have deep erosion, so lucencies, like in this case, in the, in the uh, flexor surface and navicular bone, and that's what you'll expect to see on MRI, is a large reaction in navicular bone and uh, tendon uh, abnormalities. Uh, many times in this location, we'll have an adhesion um, uh, between the two. Um, which may also influence the prognosis. Um, in many cases, you will also have navicular bursitis in association with the, ten the tendon lesion. So all these things can be um, sort of thought about if you see um, a, sort, uh, a deep <coughs> erosion. Um, the distal phalanx, we have, if we look at the palmar surface of the distal phalanx, <coughs> We have deep shoulder flexor tendon and impal ligament sort of inserting together uh, at the level of the uh, flexor surface of the distal phalanx, um, which we can see here. Um, and, and then we have the collateral ligaments of the distal and phalangeal joint, which will insert in the collateral fossa. And I will talk a little bit about uh, both, both structures. Um, Many of the findings I, I, I talk about may be obvious in if you have a, a certain projection, like a very well uh, positioned lateral media view, but might not be very evident in other view, in, if you have a slight obliquity. So it's quite important to make sure that your radiographs you look at are actually um, very um, well positioned. Um, the first thing I want to talk to you about is this... Um, also resorption of the flexor surface because it's something that actually, uh, well, before this paper was published, I don't think I've ever seen, uh, but now I've seen three last week. Uh, so I don't know if that's becomes more common or it's just, I don't know, uh, just I notice it more. Um, um, so in this paper, they looked at uh, horses that had MRI findings of also resorption at the insertion of the impal ligament. Um, and uh, also resorption was described as, as a lesion that is more than two millimeters in width. And there they compared those which, uh, uh, they compare it to the uh, radiographs and see how many of this lesion they could see in radiographs. And they found, um, so this is the sort of lesion you can see in radiograph when you have resorption. Um, and they found that actually uh, radiologists was quite, uh, uh, specific to detect the lesion, but had low sensitivity. Um, so basically, if you see the lesion, it's definitely there, but if you don't see it, you don't know. A little bit like fragments, if you see them, they're there. If you don't, they might be. Um, the interesting thing of this is that um, the lesion was located at the insertion at the, of the impal ligament and, and deep tubular flexor tendon, and they did see concurrent lesion in the deep tubular flexor tendon in most horses. I mean, they had only eight in their group. Um, what I also thought was interesting is the tendon lesion was not necessarily at the insertion. So I'm not sure if the two were necessarily related. Um, and on post-mortem, they did find uh, abnormalities in the impal ligament and in the tendon at the insertion um, to, to support the wear pathology in these two structures. Um, this is one case, uh, what you can see how it looks on MRI. So you have a sort of hyperintense lesion surrounded by uh, sclerosis, and this is on stir. This is slightly unusual because it's a back to the midline most of the time in the, are in the, on the midline. And this horse, so this horse also had a tendon, um, a tendon lesion. Um, this is one of the horses I had last week. Um, and this is a nine years old thoroughbred, uh, but it's used for, I don't remember, like show jumping or eventing, I don't remember. Um, anyway, this horse was lame after pulling a shoe a week, a month before, um, but then it stayed lame. Um, uh, so they took radiographs and, and then I had the, uh, well, I received the MRI and, and the, the, the history said, blah, 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 radiographs normal. And then I looked at the MRI and then I said, please, can you send me the radiographs? Um, 
you have looked at the radiographs now, and then I can show you the MRI, uh, and then you can understand why I thought about seeing the radiographs. So these are the two feet, and I think if you look at the lateral media view, you can clearly see that this flexor surface is very irregular. You can also imagine a loosened area here. Obviously, it's much easier when you know that it's there, uh, but I think if you don't look, you will never find them. Um, and you can see the lucency here. Um, I mean, evaluation of the lateral media view is not discussed in the paper that I have presented to you earlier, but I think it's, uh, it's quite useful. But it has to be relatively well positioned. If you look at the right limb, I mean, the cystic lesion is so much bigger on this side, as you can see on the MRI, uh, but it's much less evident on the radiographs. And I think the reason is because it's just quite oblique uh, compared to, to this one. Um, so, so this horse had, this was the only problem the horse had. He had it bilaterally, which is quite unusual. Um, so, so to me, the diagnosis is ligament dysmorphity plus osteocystalic lesion and insertion. Um, uh, as I said, if you look at the flexor surface in the lateral media view, you should remember that actually the shape changes slightly uh, between horses. Uh, so some have a bit more flat appearance and some have a little bit more undulating appearance. And that's because in some cases like this one, for example, you have um, antesified at the insertion of the deep gel flexor tendon, uh, which we do see on MRI very often. And they did say in initial papers that these were more common in horses that had tendon lesion, but to be honest, I see so often that I, I don't think I would predict a tendon lesion just by an antecifite. Um, this is another case of last week, <laughs> where you can see again the lucency in the lateral medial view and the very large uh, cyst in uh, the... Um, and at the insertion of the impal ligament. You can see how the impal ligament sort of blends into the cyst, and you can imagine that the ligaments must be, must be abnormal. Um, what strikes me on this radiograph is that the lesion is so much smaller and so much easily missed compared to how big is an MRI. You wouldn't believe it's the same horse, but it is. And that's because just the sensitivity of, you know, the amount of changes you need to have on radios to be seen, they, they must be quite big. Um, I will move on to talk about the angular cartilages. Um, there are loads of papers out about angular cartilages and about what we should look at um, as potential uh, significant ossification of the angular cartilage. So we know that if we look on the DP view, if uh, the cartilage is ossified more than grade three, that may be uh, significant, so more than the proximal border of the navicular bone. And we know from various uh, comparative radiology and MRI studies that there is an association uh, between, um, between the presence of ossification of the angular cartilage and the dysmorphity of the collateral ligament. So I don't think we should ignore uh, these findings. Obviously, if it's only a grade one or grade two, I will personally just report it, but not make anything very much out of it, but if it's markedly ossified, um, uh, we should definitely mention that there is a possibility that the horse has collateral ligament dysmitis. Um, this is a horse I found in my archive, and um, this horse had bilateral lameness. He had bilateral radiographs, um, bilateral and biaxial ossification of the angular cartilages. Fortunately, DP was not acquired. That's why I... I'm not showing you that view, but I think that's the best one to um, look at the um, angular cartilages. If you look at these cartilages themselves, um, the opacity in the cartilage is actually normal. They are just ossified. Um, but when we look at the MRI, you can clearly see that there is reduced signal intensity at the base of the cartilage, so sclerosis, and you can see how the sclerosis will involve also the collateral fossa because it's ex the base of the cartilage is actually just palmar to the collateral fossa, so then you can imagine why the collateral ligament could also be affected. And this horse had bilateral and biaxial collateral ligament dysmorphism, which was more obvious on uh, this uh, lateral side, um, as you can see. Um, something that is not quite as much thought about, but I think is important to mention, and sometimes horses with ossification, the angular cartilage, have I mean, many horses actually have collateral zamoidian ligament dysmitis. And while preparing that talk, this talk, 
uh, actually most of horses then uh, that I've you know, just done loads of radios that had dosified cartilage and actually had collapsomidian ligament dysmopathy. Uh, and, and this is one example. You have a, a marked dosified cartilage and you have the collapsomidian ligament abnormalities. And in this case, the collateral ligament itself actually was normal. Uh, it was only the collapsomidian ligament. Um, and this feature is actually mentioned. It's mentioned only in this paper by um, Kurt and Natasha, where they looked at... Uh, fracture of the palmar process of dysophalings in association with um, ossification of the angular cartilage. Just, and, and in these group of horses, uh, which were not very many, I think there were only like 20, all horses that had that feature will have collapsed with the ligament dysmitis. So that's another thing to think about. And then we have obviously ligaments that will attach the collateral, the, the angular cartilage just, to, to the bone, so the chondro ligament, and we can think that uh, pathology of this ligament may be present when there is ossification of the angular cartilages. Um, this may not be present on its own. It might be associated with either pathology of the collateral ligament or collapse of the ligaments, but um, we should remember these ligaments. So the most important ones to remember are the chondrocoronal ligament, which extend from the dorsal proximal aspect of the cartilages to the uh, dorsal um, uh, aspect of the uh, middle phalanx, so insert just proximal to the origin of the collateral ligament. And the other one is the chondrocesamoidean ligament, which is here, and it um, goes from the uh, lateral medial border of the navicular bone to the angular cartilage, and is just distal to the collateral ligament. Um, and we, we do know from, uh, from papers that there is an association between, uh, sorry, the lesion in, the, in this chondro ligaments are more likely to be present in horses with ossification of the cartilages. And I, and, and I would expect to have chondrocoronal ligament dysmopathy in association with collateral ligament dysmopathy and chondrocoronal ligament dysmopathy in association with um, collateral ligament dysmopathy. However, I don't think there are radiographic findings which we can find to predict lesions of these ligaments. The only thing we can say is that there is an ossified cartilage and these ligaments may be affected. Um, other than in this case, um, so this horse had a wound on the dorsal aspect of the limb um, and uh, as it happened, the, wind, the wound went better but the horse stayed lame um, and then they radiographed the horse and they found this new bone formation. Uh, I don't know if this was present before the wound or uh, came out, but since the wound was dorsal and this is clearly on the lateral side, it might have been there before, I don't know. Um, so then if we look at this, uh, if we look at this site on the book, then we'll find that on this lateral aspect of the uh, proximal phalanx will be the ligament of the angular cartridge inserting. And if I go back to Denoir's pictures, so this is the chondrocompedal ligament, which extends from the cartilage proximally to the, to the P1 and joins in with the uh, ligament of the digital cushions. I mean, I never thought these ligaments were very interesting before looking at MRI, but now I find them very interesting. Um, and they happen to both insert uh, on this location. And it's interesting that this side, the cartilage is also more ossified than the other side, and, and we have these changes. Um, and when we looked at the MRI, well, there was clearly ossification of the cartilage, which is fracture, and we can see bone edema in the cartilage, and there is abnormalities of, um, well, it's difficult to tell from this picture, but I think both the collateral ligament and the chondrocesomidian ligaments are affected. And then if you go in the past, then actually you can see swelling on this side compared to this side, which you possibly see on radiograph, I'm not sure. Um, but you can clearly see on, 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 on MRI. And you can see the reaction in the bone, which is much more difficult to spot on MRI than it was on radiographs. Um, but you can see the ligament um, enthesiopathy as well. Uh, is this more significant than this? Probably not. But anyway, at least we explain why we have uh, this... Um, this radiographic finding. Um, 
I find personally the collateral fossa very difficult to evaluate, um, and that's because in many horses, when you acquire those proximal palmar disc oblique view, you might not see it clearly. Um, and I think that depends on the angle you acquire your, your oblique views. Uh, but if you have a very nice uh, position view, you can see the fossa nicely. Uh, here, um, and when they look at a comparative MRI radiographic um, uh, study, they found that about 10% of uh, horses with evidence of uh, osteos remodeling at the insertion of the osteos remodeling associated with the collateral ligament will have radiographic changes. This study actually looked at both um, origin and insertion of the ligaments, so not just the collateral fossa, and what they saw that they could see on radiographs was uh, mainly cystic lesion uh, at the insertion or origin of the ligaments, and then um, anticipate formation at the origin of the ligaments, which you will see in this location. And I put this view mainly uh, to say that I, uh, I'd rather have a flexed oblique view to look at the origin of the ligaments rather than a standing one, because I think it's easier, um, it's easier to look at this region. Um, I did try to find you an example where I thought the collateral fossa was irregular, and then I could correlate an MRI by a struggle. Um, so this horse, I think he has remodeling of the collateral fossa, mainly on this side. And I think if you look very carefully, perhaps this fossa is a little bit irregular. I do not think I would have uh, picked it up from radiographs. I think that's very difficult um, to see. Um, also, I think by looking at loads of MRIs that the fossa changes in shape between horses. I haven't managed to do this study yet, but I think a horse is with... Um, uh, like cob-type horses will have much more irregular fossa than uh, a thoroughbred, uh, and then and therefore I really find it difficult to understand what this means. However, sometimes you do find changes that are actually going to be um, significant, um, and there is no doubt that these are abnormal. Um, so this is. Um, a sheer jumping horse, um, warm bloods, and this horse had a lameness, it says summer, so about eight months ago, and then he went fine, sound, uh, competed in his uh, jumping fine, and then he went acutely lame uh, about a week, two weeks before the MRIs. Um, and these are the recent radiographs. And when I briefly looked at these radios on my phone, very naughty, um, is I, I really picked up this very odd spur on the uh, dorsolateral aspect of the, of the foot, which is a bit unusual. Um, but actually, then, if you get out of your phone and go on your computer, um, then you can actually see many more things. Um, and if we look carefully at this fossa, I think uh, you can uh, make out a, a lucency here. Potentially, this fossa also has a lucency, but I'm not quite as sure. Certainly, here there is something. And then you can correlate, actually, on this DP view, which is probably not the best view usually to see the collateral fossa, you can see this uh, lucency as well. And I think you can see here as well. Uh, and I, I, obviously, these are two different views, but again, if you look at the collateral fossa, uh, you can see if you do a flex view, uh, the navicular bone moves proximally, and actually you can see the fossa here, while if you do a standing view, you won't be able to see it. Um, so if you're trying to uh, you know, see a lesion like this better, then perhaps acquire a, a flex view. And this is this MRI of this poor horse. Um, so it was a very large cystic lesion biaxially, actually, and they had it bilaterally and biaxially. Um, and this is the parasagittal view through this cyst, and this is parasagittal view through this cyst. And you can see how large this is um, and involves the entire insertion of the ligament. And the reason why the horse went to QT lane is just the ligaments, basically, um, well evolved from his, from his insertion. I um, mean, this marks abnormality of the, of, of, of the ligament here. Um, I think it's possible that this lesion was present there at the original time when the lameness uh, uh, started, but I don't have previous radiographs, so I don't know. But certainly, um, the ligament is the cause for, for the lesion. But we could sort of predict it. The lesion is so big on the radiographs that we could think went acutely lame because perhaps most likely the collateral ligaments had a problem. Um, 
Uh, this is, is another horse, which is different history, but it, a horse had a chronic osteoarthritis dysphalangeal joint, so I assume he had radiographic changes for a long time. I only have recent radiographs. Um, which you can see here, we have remodeling here. Um, but then it developed a firm swelling on the dorsal medial aspect of the coronary band. And you can see it here. So then the vets wanted to know, is this associated with osteoarthritis? There's something else uh, going on. And, well, to me, it's quite unusual for an osteoarthritis to have a unilateral swelling because I would expect that it will swell more dorsally, uh, but I think this is just superimposition because it's on the other side, and if it does swell, it swells both sides. So I was a bit reluctant about this osteoarthritis diagnosis. So if you look carefully at these radiographs, I think you can see that there is a cystic lesion here, and uh, it's here, and here and on this lateral side, oh, sorry, medial side. Um, so it's quite well defined and is in the position where I expect the collateral fossa to be, so where the collateral ligaments will origin. Um, so my thought about this case, unfortunately I do not have the MRI of this, uh, my thought about this is actually this horse had a collateral ligament dysmopathy um, associated with mainly its origin uh, and that's why it has this swelling. And I know what you're going to say, you're going to say well this swelling is much more proximal than where the collateral ligament is. But you have the, co the coronary band here so you wouldn't expect swelling to go much lower. And the reason why I did think this is ba basically based on this other case, which I do have only the MRI off and not the radiographs. And if we look at this, this high field, so you can see the reference line going up here. Yeah, and you can see the swelling where it is. Look at the swelling, it's very proximal. And then you can see the ligament is much lower than the swelling, but you can certainly see that the ligament is very abnormal. Uh, and actually this one, I even said it was ruptured uh, to me. So even if the swelling is much more proximal uh, than, the, than the ligament probably is, I think in that previous case also he had, um, he had a collateral ligament injury. And this horse also had osteotretic changes on the dorsal acid of the, uh, of the um, P2, which were completely unrelated to, to, to the current lameness. Unfortunately, I begged for an MRI of the other case or a CT or anything, but they didn't give it to me. Um, uh, last thing uh, that I'm going to talk to you about is soft tissue mineralization. Um, occasionally, uh, we see mineralization associated with, the, uh, with soft tissue, specifically uh, the deep digital flexor tendon, and usually in the foot, these are associated with tendon lesion. This horse also had an erosion of the palmar compact bone, uh, which you can see is thickened, not the best lateral media view, but we can see the palmar compact bone is thickened. And, um, and if we look at the MRI of this horse, you can see that there is a large tendon lesion which continues, 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 and you have also the erosion. Um, so I think you could have predicted most of this from, from the radiographs. Obviously, you don't know the exact extent of the lesion um, by the radius on their own, but you can uh, think about it. Um, this is a paper that just came out that I wanted to mention. It's an ultrasound paper, but uh, just remember that sometimes we do have soft tissue mineralization, uh, which are incidental findings. Um, this paper actually looked at lesion more proximally, so not in the foot, more in the parson and fetlow region, uh, but um, you know, not all the lesions are necessarily significant. Um, this is the very last thing, actually, and it just quickly think about the uh, capsular attachment of the distant pharyngeal joint on the P2. We do see uh, remodeling of the bone, which is uh, on the dorsal aspect of the bone rather than the periarticular, and sometimes we can see thickening of the cortex as well, and horses with a thickened cortex, I would um, think that they have more reaction in the bone associated with the attachment of the capture rather than horses that don't have this finding and perhaps it's more significant. Um, and some of these horses will have a stir signal at the attachment of the, um, of the joint capture. As you can see, this horse 
there's not very much swelling of the joint itself, but there is definitely some enthesiopathy at, at its insertion. And um, so that's another thing we can look at. Uh, I am concluding almost in time. Um, so has, you can see there are a lot of changes that we can see on radiographs, uh, which, um, which we that may be associated with soft tissue injury. Um, and, uh, and if we look at the radiographs carefully and we take good radiographs that perhaps we can see them, uh, we should try not to overinterpret things too much. Um, but um, sometimes radiographic changes are very subtle and, and we might not see them, so perhaps we still, obviously we still need MRI. And, and if we do see changes radiographically, we can think about the ligaments, that a ligament may be affected, but at the end, until we actually take an MRI, we want to know exactly the extent of the lesion most of the time. Um, other than flexor cortex erosion, um, most of the other lesion I don't think I will be quite so sure to predict the soft tissue lesion from. Maybe the cyst or the impel ligament dysmorphosy as well. Um, um, also, obviously, many, many horses uh, have normal radiographs for real and then have soft tissue injuries on MRI. Um, so that's another limitation of radiographs. Thank you very much. Any questions?